Hey guys, so today we're going to talk about the nervous system and TBI. However, as I'm going to record these back to back, however, I'm going to split them up into two videos and I'm going to still try and keep both of them together under an hour, but there's a ton of stuff to cover. So <laughs> I'm just going to get after it. Also, it might feel like I'm going to go really, really fast through this stuff. So if you're like, oh my gosh, all right. Just take notes. You have everything that I put in here is referenced in the book or most everything. There are a few things that may not be here, but um, let's get started just so we can keep our keep the pace going. OK, so the oh, yeah, by the way, the first thing I'm going to tell you, too, is there's so much medical information here that we can't possibly cover it in one class. This is like an entire uh, undergraduate degree that somebody could get in nursing or something like this. So. Keep in mind that if you feel like this is going too fast, that's okay because it's a ton of information. If you feel like it's going too slow, that means you're a smarty pants and you might be a good fit for working in a, a setting where this stuff is really sort of common language. But not all of you are going to end up in a setting that's that's highly medical, so some of this may not be as necessary. What I really want to do, as I've said over and over again, either in the class or uh, as I give these videos, is I want to understand as counselors, what do we do with this information? So I'm going to go really fast through the information itself and then talk about what is this useful for and how can we uh, turn this into an intervention that we use to work with clients and their families and that kind of thing. So anyway, let's understand the basic functions of the nervous system. Um, the basic functions of the nervous system, by the way, we're talking brain, spinal cord, all the nerves and all that stuff. Uh, voluntary muscle movements, reflex actions to keep a person safe. In other words, like the body preserves itself by if it touches something hot, it pulls back. If it sees a line in the grass, it fight, flight, or freezes. <laughs> Fights, flights, or freezes. Something like that. Um, and then also, one of the important functions that I think uh, sometimes we forget in a, in a psychological way, but we know it in a physical way, is it keeps homeostasis. Homeostasis is equilibrium or balance. In other words, the body... Uh, if it gets hot, it tries to cool itself down. If it gets cold, it tries to warm itself up and all kinds of different complicated functions that if a muscle works this way, it should also work this way, that kind of stuff. So uh, psychologically, that's going to be really important and we'll kind of get to that in a little bit. But maintaining the appropriate amount of rest and activity and uh, stimulation and uh, rest or something like that. So uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. One of the things that's not in the book that, that they won't talk about is the parasympathetic and nervous and sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for our fight or flight response that I just mentioned. This is going to be incredibly important and we'll allude to it a little bit, but it's more important for the psychological parts of counseling and less important for the biological and physical stuff that we're trying to understand mostly in this class. So um, just so that said, some of the stuff we're going to talk about sort of, it's complicated, but it fits into categories of, is this Sympathetic or parasympathetic? Well, this is just another way of talking about it in terms of its biology versus its psychology, something like that. But Okay, we have a central nervous system. I already mentioned brain and spinal cord. This is a really cool... Um, I'm going to open this up, actually. I think it's going to pull it off screen. We'll see if I can bring it over. There we go. This thing's super cool. It's going to take a long time, apparently, to load in. <laughs> I wonder if I can do full screen. Oh, yeah, that's even better. Okay, so uh, I'm going to reference this in, uh, I'm not going to talk about it too much, but the link is here if you want to see it. Um, uh, if you're online, I'll, I'll see if I can show it to you later, but just Google like brain anatomy map or something like that, and you can find things like this. But you'll see uh, it really highlights these different parts of the brain. Um, I might reference these from time to time, but for the most part, I'm going to um, keep that off screen uh, because I really want to just sort of talk about... Uh, talk about these things and move through them kind of quick. Um, okay, so let's see. There is fluid all over inside the brain. You have this skull, you have your hair and your skin and all that kind of stuff, and then you have your skull. Then you have these multiple layers of kind of, um, some of them are just like um, matter or cells, kind of like a sheath over it. And some of them, the primary function is like kind of a, a, a fluid sac to sort of keep in the fluids and keep other things out and stuff. But there's multiple layers of that, okay? Uh, which we'll talk about also in a minute. Um, I say there's fluid all over, technically speaking, because it's it's there's so much more complicated things to explain for this. But it's the purpose is for cushioning and to help facilitate spacing of things, so there's enough space for blood to flow and things aren't constricted and that kind of thing. Um, then we have these cortexes. These are going to be important too. Now they break these down in the book into motor, sensory, and associational. But a lot of times you'll hear things like 
The prefrontal cortex is the place of executive functioning, whatever. We talk about this in the psychology world a little bit. We talk about it in the, a little bit differently than we talk about in the medical world. So when you hear about things like the frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex and higher order executive functionings, all this stuff that's mentioned right up here, um, that's part of the associational cortex. Now, if you were to dig much further into the, the brain's anatomy and how it affects different parts of the body and all this kind of stuff, this is what neurologists do and uh, neuropsychologists and physiatrists and people who really study the brain, they will do that. We don't typically have to spend as much time saying like, well, the damage to the brain happened here. So that's the motor cortex on this side of the body. It's so, you know, that kind of stuff. We're going to cover that, those things, but it's less important because what we want to know is, okay, now that you've, now that some, uh, the doctors have figured out where the damage happened and how to do the medical interventions, we just have to figure out, okay, if the body's moving this way, we have to figure out how to deal with that. So it's less important that we understand the causes and the, the functionings of the body, but um, this, is, this is just sort of background stuff to help us with that. This is probably obvious here, but um, damage to one part of a body may have consequences to, rela consequences to relationships to other functions <laughs> or relationships to other functions. The point of this here is to say that um, there's like a chain reaction because everything is so interconnected. And sometimes there are strange reactions and sometimes things we can expect because we understand how these things work. So one of the things you should just kind of understand about any of this stuff when it comes to brain injury and probably just to, you know many different kinds of body functions is that if one thing happens, it's going to set up a chain reaction. And what we want to do is understand what are those chain reactions. So we'll be talking about that as we go. Okay. Uh, another part of the brain functioning is the brain can be split. This part, this part's not in the book, by the way. The brain can be thought of into sort of two different parts. We have this fast track and slow track. Um, if you if you did a little bit of googling on this or some sort of internet search, you could find out more information on this. But this is relatively new stuff in our understanding. But it makes a little bit of sort of practical sense. And this stuff also will have a little bit more implication when it gets to how do we, uh, in, in other sort of psychological areas, and how do we deal with this stuff as counselors. But we're not going to go too deep into that, but I at least want to mention it here. One of the things we know is that we have this fast track brain. In other words, things happen super fast. There's actually uh, studies about the timing of how quickly these things happen in their, you know, in just minuscule amounts of time. But um, it's like the automatic stuff that happens to us. Uh, that is part of our, what the book says, or what I, some of our resources say, it's like the reptilian brain. As our brain evolved, it was kind of this core stuff as an animal brain. You can see, actually, if you, if you look at the evolution of uh, human beings, we were, uh, look, we had these like flat foreheads that did not involve any of this upper stuff. And then as we evolved, our brains grew bigger and this kind of, our uh, higher order functions kind of grew over the top of this animal stuff. Well, the animal stuff is just mostly there for physical preservation, like we mentioned earlier. And so uh, our reaction times, if you ever have that experience where like you react to something and you don't even really understand what's going on, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, it's because the door was slamming on my finger, but I didn't really think about it until my body moved or something like that. Um, that's an example of how your body sort of sees this stuff. It takes in sensory information and touch information and all that kind of stuff and it reacts to it in this kind of animal-like way. Just our, our physiology does that. And then as our higher order functionings catch up to that, then we can sort of make sense of it. It, it provides us with meaning. So um, that's that, that secondary stuff is called the slow track, or it's kind of the newer things that evolve. And basically what we're saying there is like, you know, when it comes to decision-making and understanding uh, meaning and um, how, our, how we understand emotions, and a, and a lot of those kind of functions, most of those are in this prefrontal area, or at least in the cor associational cortexes, and the, the top and front and kind of, you know, over here some, somewhere. If you ever heard the story in uh, undergrad psych classes about Phineas Cage, you got the, the pole that went right up through his head uh, and kind of destroyed parts of this stuff. He could function, his body could function, he could do a lot of the same physical functions, but he was a different person because it changed the way his behavior act, his behavior, it changed his personality, it changed his uh, social impulsivity, that kind of stuff. Or as another example, have you ever heard of uh, lobotomies that used to happen um, where basically they would take like kind of an ice pick looking thing, 
stick it up through the orbital socket right here, and then just kind of dig around and like destroy the whole frontal lobe, where a lot of uh, social inhibitions <laughs> were corrected, and a lot of our uh, personality behaviors, kind of the things that we do in relation to other people, that kind of just breaks down some of that stuff. Um, also, our awareness of how we feel, one of those things that kind of makes us human, um, sort of higher order thinking in the way that like we can think about how we think. It kind of destroys that. And if people are depressed and they're like, I think I'm feeling bad about how I think about things and I just, you know, it kind of has that cycle to it. That's why in severe depression, lobotomies were an option because you could go in there and just kind of tear that stuff up. And a person would essentially destroy the, the upper parts of the brain that make them human and uh, basically live as kind of an animal more or less. It's not exactly that simplistic, but that's kind of the idea here. Um, but this has a lot of social implications of how we bond to other people socially and how do we learn to love. And so we're going to talk about this too. Um, this is a little bit, uh, I don't want to get too far into this, I guess, but like when babies make attachment, it's a, it's a highly um, biological process, meaning as the lower parts of their brain are functioning and it's kind of still growing, the upper parts are growing and continues to develop up through teenage and, you know, kind of beginning of adulthood sort of thing. Um, the, the baby's process of love is just touch me and hold me and give me milk and do those, those kind of things. And then as people grow and they develop, it becomes more of like, well, what does your love mean to me? And then we get all kinds of uh, songs and Disney movies and Hallmark TV and all that kind of crap that comes along with it. Okay. Uh, spinal cord, here's just basic anatomy. Uh, the vertebrae protects the spinal cord. The right brain affects the left side of the body. So there's kind of a crossover switch. Um, some of you might remember from your uh, brain anatomy uh, studies beforehand, there's a part of the brain called the corpus callosum that connects the two sides of the brain. And that's where that switch happens inside the brain. So um, someone gets damaged over here in this side, of the this side of the brain, it will affect this side of the body. So just one of those basic things. Um, also, something that, that was in the book, but it's not in this picture that I stole off the internet, basically. Um, Akata aquina, that's some, a term you'll hear from time to time. You'll hear this because the, this little section down here, the bottom section, the lumbar nerves, if you hear of akata aquina, injury kata aquina literally means horse's tail. And it's that kind of fray of nerves that goes down into the tailbone. Um, somebody has a tailbone injury, it's kind of the kata aquina injury. Uh, but also the nerves to go down into the legs. And so even in spinal cord injuries, you'll hear about like, you know, the 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 nerve tracks that go down in the lower regions of the body, that kind of stuff. Um, but I just want to add that in there because I thought it might be helpful. Another note, you don't have to memorize these, but the more you know, the better, uh, and you will understand this stuff. So I kind of already mentioned that. Um, one of the things that I thought was worth uh, emphasizing a little bit is there's more and more research uh, understanding the function of the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve is one that runs, you can actually see it from, let me just show you this real quick because it's fun. Um, let's see if I can transfer it over here really quick. Uh, there we go. The vagus nerve, <clears throat> excuse me, it's in the book, but uh, you can see it here too. It's at the very back of the brain stem. And what it does is it goes down into our, you know, kind of back down here, but it goes into our abdominal cavity and it regulates things like um, breathe, uh, breathing, heartbeat, um, blood flow to the digestive system, that kind of stuff. And so we've known that there's a relationship between food and wellness and our, you know, the butterflies that we get in our stomach has something to do with anxiety and that fight or flight response. Um, sometimes people feel kind of sick and nauseous when they get anxious, that kind of thing. Um, we've known that happens, but we're starting to learn more about this vagus nerve and what it means. One of the interesting things, and that's this little bullet point up here, is that the mindfulness counseling practices that we hear a lot about, we're starting to learn more about that body-mind relationship and how the practice of breathing and meditation and prayer and that kind of stuff, how it can train those automatic responses. So what I mean by that is that our heartbeat slows down and speeds up and it seems like it's involuntary, like it just happens to us. Think of like a person going into panic attack mode. The heart beats faster, you start sweating and you, you breathe, you know, kind of hyperventilate a little bit and you just like, oh my gosh, something's going on. It's really big and scary and all this kind of stuff. And what we're learning is that if we can use voluntary practices like 
breathing exercises or prayer meditation. In other words, remember I was saying like it's really important to have periods of rest and activity or stimulation and rest, something like that. Um, if during our times of rest, we can train, we can use our things like breathing and um, uh, restful activities to train our body to sort of be in the, in the mode of rest. That way, when situations come up that would normally elevate our sense of anxiety or f fears or something like that, we can sort of train the brain to say, okay, we know how to bring this back down, um, either voluntarily through other breathing practices or just set the default a little lower so you don't quite as uh, experience quite as intense of panic and intense of anxiety, that kind of stuff. So really interesting stuff, but it's very biologically related too, and we're just learning more about that as we go. Um, okay, I think I mentioned already this kind of stuff, balancing and rest, uh, balancing rest and action is a big part of our biology. Yep, got it. Okay, the book mentions that sexual arousal is also part of the rest system. I'm just gonna leave that one there right now because um, I don't really have much else to say about it, except for, I wanna acknowledge as much about sexuality as we can because it's one of those topics that gets lost, forgotten, or people just feel uncomfortable about it and we don't really know what to do about it um, because it's so involved in our, uh, our morality systems and our social organization systems and uh, it's just very controversial. So I wanna keep mentioning it uh, as we go through these medical conditions so that we can pay attention to it as we go. Uh, and then future conversations can be about well, what does that actually mean? What do we do with that information? Okay, this one was kind of a short, brief one, but I'm going to uh, leave it here and uh, we'll pick up in the next one. See ya.